Section 35 of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in July 2012. Letter 28, Part 2. Ikarigazeki. I have well nigh exhausted the resources of this place. They are to go out three times a day to see how much the river has fallen, to talk with the housemaster and kocho, to watch the children's games and the making of shingles, to buy toys and sweetmeats and give them away, to apply zinc lotion to a number of sore eyes three times daily, under which treatment during three days there has been a wonderful amendment, to watch the cooking, spinning and other domestic processes in the daidokoro, to see the horses, which are also actually in it, making meals of green leaves of trees instead of hay, to see the lepers, who are here for some waters which are supposed to arrest, if not to cure, their terrible malady, to lie on my stretcher and sew, and read the papers of the Asiatic Society, and to go over all possible routes to Aomori. The people have become very friendly in consequence of the eye lotion, and bring many diseases for my inspection, most of which would never have arisen had cleanliness of clothing and person been attended to. The absence of soap, the infrequency with which clothing is washed, and the absence of linen next the skin, cause various cutaneous diseases, which are aggravated by the bites and stings of insects. Scald head affects nearly half the children here. I am very fond of Japanese children. I have never yet heard a baby cry, and I have never seen a child troublesome or disobedient. Filial piety is the leading virtue in Japan, and unquestioning obedience is the habit of centuries. The arts and threats by which English mothers cajole or frighten children into unwilling obedience appear unknown. I admire the way in which children are taught to be independent in their amusements. Part of the home education is the learning of the rules of the different games, which are absolute, and when there is a doubt, instead of a quarrelsome suspension of the game, the fiat of a senior child decides the matter. They play by themselves and don't bother adults at every turn. I usually carry sweeties with me and give them to the children, but not one has ever received them without first obtaining permission from the father or mother. When that is gained, they smile and bow profoundly, and hand the sweeties to those present before eating any themselves. They are gentle creatures, but too formal and precocious. They have no special dress. This is so queer that I cannot repeat it too often. At three they put on the kimono and girdle, which are as inconvenient to them as to their parents, and childish play in this garb is grotesque. I have, however, never seen what we call child's play, that general abandonment to miscellaneous impulses, which consists in struggling, slapping, rolling, jumping, kicking, shouting, laughing, and quarrelling. Two fine boys are very clever in harnessing paper carts to the back of beetles with gummed traces, so that eight of them draw a load of rice up an inclined plane. You can imagine what the fate of such a load and team would be at home among a number of snatching hands. Here a number of infants watch the performance with motionless interest and never need the adjuration, don't touch. In most of the houses there are bamboo cages for the shrill-voiced Katie did, and the children amuse themselves with feeding these vociferous grasshoppers. The channels of swift water in the street turn a number of toy water-wheels, which set in motion most ingenious mechanical toys, of which a model of the automatic rice-husker is the commonest, and the boys spend much time in devising and watching these, which are really very fascinating. It is the holidays, but holiday tasks are given, and in the evenings you hear the hum of lessons all along the street for about an hour. The school examination is at the reopening of the school after the holidays, instead of at the end of the session, an arrangement which shows an honest desire to discern the permanent gain made by the scholars. This afternoon has been fine and windy, and the boys have been flying kites, made of tough paper on a bamboo frame, all of a rectangular shape, some of them five feet square and nearly all decorated with huge faces of historical heroes. Some of them have a humming arrangement made of whalebone. 
there was a very interesting contest between two great kites and it brought out the whole population the string of each kite for thirty feet or more below the frame was covered with pounded glass made to adhere very closely by means of tenacious glue and for two hours the kite fighters tried to get their kites into a proper position for sawing the adversary's string in two at last one was successful and the severed kite became his property upon which victor and vanquished exchanged three long bows silently as the people watched and received the destruction of their bridge so silently they watched this exciting contest the boys also flew their kites while walking on stilts a most dexterous performance in which few were able to take part and then a larger number gave a stilt race the most striking of outdoor games are played at fixed seasons of the year and are not to be seen now there are twelve children in this yadoya and after dark they regularly play at a game which ito says is played in the winter in every house in japan the children sit in a circle the adults look on eagerly child worship being more common in japan than in america and to my thinking the japanese form is the best from proverbial philosophy to personal privation is rather a descent but owing to the many detentions on the journey my small stock of foreign food is exhausted and i have been living here on rice cucumbers and salt salmon so salt that after being boiled in two waters it produces a most distressing thirst even this has failed to-day as communication with the coast has been stopped for some time and the village is suffering under the calamity of its stock of salt fish being completely exhausted there are no eggs and rice and cucumbers are very like the light food which the israelites loathed i had an omelette one day but it was much like musty leather the italian minister said to me in tokyo no question in japan is so solemn as that of food and many others echoed what i thought at the time a most unworthy sentiment i recognized its truth to-day when i opened my last resort a box of brand's meat lozenges and found them a mass of mouldiness one can only dry clothes here by hanging them in the wood smoke so i prefer to let them mildew on the walls and have bought a straw raincoat which is more reliable than the paper waterproofs i hear the hum of the children at their lessons for the last time for the waters are falling fast and we shall leave in the morning i l b end of section thirty five thirty six of unbeaten tracks in japan by isabella l bird this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by Hawaii in july two thousand and twelve letter twenty nine kureishi august five after all the waters did not fall as was expected and i had to spend a fourth day at ikarigazeki we left early on saturday as we had to travel fifteen miles without halting the sun shone on all the beautiful country and on all the wreck and devastation as it often shines on the dimpling ocean the day after a storm we took four men crossed two severe fords where bridges had been carried away and where i and the baggage got very wet saw great devastations and much loss of crops and felled timber passed under a cliff which for two hundred feet was composed of fine columnar basalt in six-sided prisms and quite suddenly emerged on a great plain on which green billows of rice were rolling sunlit before a fresh north wind this plain is liberally sprinkled with wooded villages and surrounded by hills one low range forming a curtain across the base of iwakisan a great snow-streaked dome which rises to the west of the plain to a supposed height of five thousand feet the water had risen in most of the villages to a height of four feet and had washed the lower part of the mud walls away the people were busy drying their tatami futons and clothing reconstructing their dikes and small bridges and fishing for the logs which were still coming down in large quantities in one town two very shabby policemen rushed upon us seized the bridle of my horse and kept me waiting for a long time in the middle of a crowd while they toilsomely bored through the passport 
turning it up and down and holding it up to the light as though there were some nefarious mystery about it my horse stumbled so badly that i was obliged to walk to save myself from another fall and just as my powers were failing we met a kuruma which by good management such as being carried occasionally brought me into kureishi a neat town of five thousand five hundred people famous for the making of clogs and combs where i have obtained a very neat airy upstairs room with a good view over the surrounding country and of the doings of my neighbours in their back rooms and gardens instead of getting on to aomori i am spending three days and two nights here and as the weather has improved and my room is remarkably cheerful the rest has been very pleasant as i have said before it is difficult to get any information about anything even a few miles off and even at the post office they cannot give any intelligence as to the date of the sailings of the mail steamer between aomori twenty miles off and hakodate the police were not satisfied with seeing my passport but must also see me and four of them paid me a polite but domiciliary visit the evening of my arrival that evening the sound of drumming was ceaseless and soon after i was in bed ito announced that there was something really worth seeing so i went out in my kimono and without my hat and in this disguise altogether escaped recognition as a foreigner kureishi is unlighted and i was tumbling and stumbling along in over haste when a strong arm cleared the way and a housemaster appeared with a very pretty lantern hanging close to the ground from a cane held in the hand thus came the phrase thy word is a light unto my feet we soon reached the point for seeing the festival procession advance towards us and it was so beautiful and picturesque that it kept me out for an hour it passed through all the streets between seven and ten p m each night during the first week in august with an ark or coffer containing slips of paper on which as i understand wishes are written and each morning at seven this is carried to the river and the slips are cast upon the stream the procession consisted of three monster drums nearly the height of a man's body covered with horse hide and strapped to the drummers and upwards and thirty small drums all beaten rubber dub dub without ceasing each drum has the tomoye painted on its ends then there were hundreds of paper lanterns carried on long poles of various lengths around a central lantern twenty feet high itself an oblong six feet long with a front and wings and all kinds of mythical and mysterious creatures painted in bright colours upon it a transparency rather than a lantern in fact surrounding it were hundreds of beautiful lanterns and transparencies of all sorts of fanciful shapes fans fishes birds kites drums the hundreds of people and children who followed all carried circular lanterns and rows of lanterns with the tomoye on one side and two chinese characters on the other hung from the eaves all along the line of the procession i never saw anything more completely like a fairy scene the undulating waves of lanterns as they swayed along the soft lights and soft tints moving aloft in the darkness the lantern-bearers being in deep shadow this festival is called the tanabata or sezeki festival but i am unable to get any information about it ito says that he knows what it means but is unable to explain and adds the phrase he always uses when in difficulties Mr. Sato would be able to tell you all about it. I L B. End of section thirty six. Twenty seven of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in July two thousand and twelve. Letter thirty. Kureishi august five this is a pleasant place and my room has many advantages besides light and cleanliness as for instance that i overlook my neighbours and that i have seen a lady at her toilet preparing for a wedding a married girl knelt in front of a black lacquer toilet box with a spray of cherry blossoms in gold sprawling over it and lacquer uprights at the top which supported a polished metal mirror 
several drawers in the toilet box were open and toilet requisites in small lacquer boxes were lying on the floor a female barber stood behind the lady combing dividing and tying her hair which like that of all japanese women was glossy black but neither fine nor long the coiffure is an erection a complete work of art two divisions three inches apart were made along the top of the head and the lock of hair between these was combed stiffened with a bandoline made from the uvario japonica raised two inches from the forehead turned back tied and pinned to the back hair the rest was combed from each side to the back and then tied loosely with twine made of paper several switches of false hair were then taken out of a long lacquer box and with the aid of a quantity of bandoline and a solid pad the ordinary smooth chignon was produced to which several loops and bows of hair were added interwoven with little dark blue crap spangled with gold a single thick square-sided tortoise-shell pin was struck through the hole as an ornament the fashions of dressing the hair are fixed they vary with the ages of female children and there is a slight difference between the coiffure of the married and unmarried the two partings on the top of the head and the chignon never vary the amount of stiffening used is necessary as the head is never covered out of doors this arrangement will last in good order for a week or more thanks to the wooden pillow the barber's work was only partially done when the hair was dressed for every vestige of recalcitrant eyebrow was removed and every downy hair which dared to display itself on the temples and neck was pulled out with tweezers this removal of all short hair has a tendency to make even the natural hair look like a wig then the lady herself took a box of white powder and laid it on her face ears and neck till her skin looked like a mask with a camel's hair brush she then applied some mixture to her eyelids to make the bright eyes look brighter the teeth were blackened or rather re-blackened with a feather brush dipped in a solution of gall nuts and iron fillings a tiresome and disgusting process several times repeated and then a patch of red was placed upon the lower lip i cannot say that the effect was pleasing but the girl thought so for she turned her head so as to see the general effect in the mirror smiled and was satisfied the remainder of her toilet which altogether took over three hours was performed in private and when she reappeared she looked as if a very unmeaning looking wooden doll had been dressed up with the exquisite good taste harmony and quietness which characterize the dress of japanese women a most rigid social etiquette draws an impassable line of demarcation between the costume of the virtuous woman in every rank and that of her frail sister the humiliating truth that many of our female fashions are originated by those whose position we the most regret and are then carefully copied by all classes of women in our country does not obtain credence among japanese women to whom even the slightest approximation in the style of hair-dressing ornament or fashion of garments would be a shame i was surprised to hear that three christian students from hirosaki wished to see me three remarkably intelligent-looking handsomely dressed young men who all spoke a little english one of them had the brightest and most intellectual face which i have seen in japan they are of the samurai class as i should have known from the superior type of face and manner they said that they heard that an english lady was in the house and asked me if i were a christian but apparently were not satisfied till in answer to the question if i had a bible i was able to produce one hirosaki is a castle town of some importance three and a half ri from here and its ex daimyo supports a high-class school or college there which has had two americans successively for its headmasters these gentlemen must have been very consistent in christian living as well as energetic in christian teaching for under their auspices thirty young men have embraced christianity as all of these are well educated and several are nearly ready to pass as teachers into government employment their acceptance of the new way may have an important bearing on the future of this region 
I L B. End of section thirty seven. of unbeaten tracks in japan by isabella l bird this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avai in july 2012 letter 31 kureishi yesterday was beautiful and dispensing for the first time with ito's attendance i took a kuruma for the day and had a very pleasant excursion into a cul-de-sac in the mountains the one drawback was the infamous road, which compelled me either to walk or be mercilessly jolted. The runner was a nice, kind, merry creature, quite delighted, Ito said, to have a chance of carrying so great a sight as a foreigner into a district in which no foreigner has ever been seen. In the absolute security of Japanese travelling, which I have fully realised for a long time, I look back upon my fears at Kazukabe with a feeling of self-contempt. The scenery, which was extremely pretty, gained everything from sunlight and colour, wonderful shades of cobalt and indigo, green blues and blue greens, and flashes of white foam in unsuspected rifts. It looked a simple, home-like region, a very pleasant land. We passed through several villages of farmers who live in very primitive habitations, built of mud, looking as if the mud had been dabbed upon the framework with the hands. The walls sloped slightly inwards, the thatch was rude, the eaves were deep and covered all manner of lumber. There was a smoke-hole in a few, but the majority smoked all over like brick-kilns. They had no windows, and the walls and rafters were black and shiny. Fowls and horses live on one side of the dark interior, and the people on the other. The houses were alive with unclothed children, and as I repassed in the evening, unclothed men and women, nude to their waists, were sitting outside their dwellings with the small fry, clothed only in amulets, about them, several big yellow dogs forming part of each family group, and the faces of dogs, children and people were all placidly contended. These farmers owned many good horses, and their crops were splendid. Probably, on Matsuri days, all appear in fine clothes taken from ample hordes. They cannot be so poor as far as the necessities of life are concerned, they are only very far back. They know nothing better and are contented, but their houses are as bad as any that I have ever seen, and the simplicity of Eden is combined with an amount of dirt which makes me sceptical as to the performance of even weekly ablutions. Upper Nakano is very beautiful, and in the autumn, when its myriads of star-leaved maples are scarlet and crimson against the dark background of cryptomeria, among which a great white waterfall gleams like a snowdrift before it leaps into the black pool below, it must be well worth a long journey. I have not seen anything which has pleased me more. There is a fine flight of moss-grown stone steps down to the water, a pretty bridge, two superb stone torii, some handsome stone lanterns, and then a grand flight of steep stone steps up a hillside dark with cryptomeria leads to a small Shinto shrine. Not far off there is a sacred tree, with the token of love and revenge upon it. The whole place is entrancing. Lower Nakano, which I could only reach on foot, is only interesting as possessing some very hot springs, which are valuable in cases of rheumatism and sore eyes. It consists mainly of tea-houses and yadoyas, and seemed rather gay. It is built around the edge of an oblong depression, at the bottom of which the bath-houses stand, of which there are four, only nominally separated, and with but two entrances, with open directly upon the bathers. In the two end-houses women and children were bathing in large tanks, and in the centre ones women and men were bathing together, but at opposite sides, with wooden ledges to sit upon all round. I followed the kurumarana blindly to the baths, and when once in I had to go out at the other side, being pressed upon by people from behind, but the bathers were too polite to take any notice of my most unwilling intrusion, and the Kuruma runner took me in without the slightest sense of impropriety in so doing. I noticed that formal politeness prevailed in the bathhouses elsewhere, 
and that dippers and towels were handed from one to another with profound bows. The public bathhouse is said to be the place in which public opinion is formed, as it is with us in clubs and public houses, and that the presence of women prevents any dangerous or seditious consequences. But the government is doing its best to prevent promiscuous bathing, and, though the reform may travel slowly into these remote regions, it will doubtless arrive sooner or later. The public bathhouse is one of the features of Japan. I. L. B. End of section 38nine of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in September 2012. Letter 32. Hakodate, Yezo, August 1878. The journey from Kuroishi to Aomori, though only twenty-two and a half miles, was a tremendous one owing to the state of the roads, for more rain had fallen, and the passage of hundreds of pack-horses heavily loaded with salt fish had turned the tracks into quagmires. At the end of the first stage the transport office declined to furnish a kuruma, owing to the state of the roads, but, as I was not well enough to ride farther, I bribed two men, for a very moderate sum, to take me to the coast, and by accommodating each other we got on tolerably, though I had to walk up all the hills and down many to get out at every place where a little bridge had been carried away that the kuruma might be lifted over the gap, and often to walk for two hundred yards at a time because it sank up to its axles in the quagmire. In spite of all precautions I was upset into a muddy ditch with the kuruma on the top of me, but, as my air-pillow fortunately fell between the wheel and me, I escaped with nothing worse than having my clothes soaked with water and mud, which, as I had to keep them on all night, might have given me cold, but did not. We met strings of pack-horses the whole way, carrying salt fish, which is taken throughout the interior. The mountain ridge, which runs throughout the main island, becomes depressed in the province of Nambu, but rises again into grand, abrupt hills at Aomori Bay. Between Kuroishi and Aomori, however, it is broken up into low ranges, scantily wooded, mainly with pine, scrub oak, and the dwarf bamboo. The sesamum ignosco, of which the incense sticks are made, covers some hills to the exclusion of all else. Rice grows in the valleys, but there is not much cultivation, and the country looks rough, cold, and hyperborean. The farming hamlets grew worse and worse, with houses made roughly of mud, with holes scratched in the side for light to get in, or for smoke to get out, and the walls of some were only great pieces of bark and bundles of straw tied to the posts with straw ropes. The roofs were untidy, but this was often concealed by the profuse growth of the watermelons which trailed over them. The people were very dirty, but there was no appearance of special poverty, and a good deal of money must be made on the horses and mago required for the transit of fish from Yezo and for rice to it. At Namioka occurred the last of the very numerous ridges we have crossed since leaving Nikko, at a point called Tsugarusaka, and from it looked over a rugged country upon a dark grey sea, nearly landlocked by pine-clothed hills of a rich purple-indigo colour. The clouds were drifting, the colour was intensifying, the air was fresh and cold, the surrounding soil was peaty, the odours of pines were balsamic, it looked, felt, and smelt like home. The grey sea was Aomori Bay, Beyond was the Tsugaru Strait. My long land journey was done. A traveller said a steamer was sailing for Yezo at night, so, in a state of joyful excitement, I engaged four men, and by dragging, pushing, and lifting, they got me into Aomori, a town of grey houses, grey roofs, and grey stones on roofs, built on a beach of grey sand, round a grey bay, a miserable-looking place, though the capital of the Ken. 
it has a great export trade in cattle and rice to yezo besides being the outlet of an immense annual emigration from northern japan to the yezo fishery and imports from hakodate large quantities of fish skins and foreign merchandise it has some trade in a pretty but not valuable seaweed or variegated lacquer called aomori lacquer but not actually made there its own speciality being a sweetmeat made of beans and sugar it has a deep and well-protected harbour but no piers or conveniences for trade it has barracks and the usual government buildings but there was no time to learn anything about it only a short half-hour for getting my ticket at the mitsubishi office where they demanded and copied my passport for snatching a morsel of fish at a restaurant where foreign food was represented by a very dirty tablecloth and for running down to the great beach where i was carried into a large sampan crowded with japanese steerage passengers the wind was rising a considerable surf was running the spray was flying over the boat the steamer had her steam up and was ringing and whistling impatiently there was a scud of rain and i was standing trying to keep my paper waterproof from being blown off when three inopportune policemen jumped into the boat and demanded my passport for a moment i wished them and the passport under the waves the steamer is a little old paddle boat of about seventy tons with no accommodation but a single cabin on deck she was as clean and trim as a yacht and like a yacht totally unfit for bad weather her captain engineers and crew were all japanese and not a word of english was spoken my clothes were very wet and the night was colder than the day had been but the captain kindly covered me up with several blankets on the floor so i did not suffer we sailed early in the evening with a brisk northerly breeze which chopped round to the southeast and by eleven blew a gale the sea ran high the steamer laboured and shipped several heavy seas much water entered the cabin the captain came below every half hour tapped the barometer sipped some tea offered me a lump of sugar and made a face and gesture indicative of bad weather and we were buffeted about mercilessly till four a m when heavy rain came on and the gale fell temporarily with it the boat is not fit for a night passage and always lies in port when bad weather is expected and as this was said to be the severest gale which has swept the tsugaru strait since january the captain was uneasy about her but being so showed as much calmness as if he had been a brighton the gale rose again after sunrise and when after doing sixty miles in fourteen hours we reached the heads of hakodate harbour it was blowing and pouring like a bad day in argyllshire the spindrift was driving over the bay the yezo mountains loomed darkly and loftily through rain and mist and wind and thunder and noises of the northern sea gave me a wild welcome to these northern shores a rocky head like gibraltar a cold-blooded looking grey town straggling up a steep hillside a few coniferae a great many grey junks a few steamers and vessels of foreign rig at anchor a number of sampans riding the rough water easily seen in flashes between gusts of rain and spindrift were all i saw but somehow it all pleased me from its breezy northern look the steamer was not expected in the gale so no one met me and i went ashore with fifty japanese clustered on the top of a decked sampan in such a storm of wind and rain that it took us one and a half hours to go half a mile i then waited shelterless on the windy beach till the customs officers were roused from their late slumbers and then battled with the storm for a mile up a steep hill i was expected at the hospitable consulate but did not know it and came here to the church mission house to which mr and mrs denning kindly invited me when i met them in tokyo i was unfit to enter a civilized dwelling my clothes besides being soaked were coated and splashed with mud up to the top of my hat my gloves and boots were finished my mud-splashed baggage was soaked with salt water 
but i feel a somewhat legitimate triumph at having conquered all obstacles and having accomplished more than i intended to accomplish when i left yedo how musical the clamour of the northern ocean is how inspiriting the shrieking and howling of the boisterous wind even the fierce pelting of the rain is home-like and the cold in which one shivers is stimulating you cannot imagine the delight of being in a room with a door that will lock or be in a bed instead of on a stretcher of finding twenty-three letters containing good news and of being able to read them in warmth and quietness under the roof of an english home i l b itinerary of route from niigata to aomori kisaki fifty-six houses fori tsuiji two hundred nine houses six ri kurakawa two hundred fifteen houses two ri twelve cho hanadatti twenty houses two ri kawaguchi twenty seven houses three ri numa twenty four houses one ri eighteen cho tamagawa forty houses three ri Okuni, two hundred ten houses, Turi, eleven cho. Kurosawa, seventeen houses, Wanri, eighteen cho. Ichinono, twenty houses, Wanri, eighteen cho. Shirokasawa, forty two houses, Wanri, twenty one cho. Tenoko, one hundred twenty houses, three ri, eleven cho. Komatsu, five hundred thirteen houses, Turi, thirteen cho. Akayu, three hundred fifty houses, four ri. Kaminoyama, six hundred fifty houses, five ri. Yamagata, twenty one thousand souls, three ri, nineteen cho. Tendo, one thousand forty houses, three ri, eight cho. Tateoka, three hundred seven houses, three ri, twenty one cho. Tochiida, two hundred seventeen houses, one ri, thirty three cho. Obanasawa, five hundred six houses, one ri, twenty one cho. Ashitsawa, seventy houses, one ri, twenty one cho. Shinjo, one thousand sixty houses, Four ri, six cho. Kanayama, one hundred sixty five houses, three ri, twenty seven cho. Nozoki, thirty seven houses, three ri, nine cho. Inai, two hundred fifty seven houses, three ri, twelve cho. Yusawa, one thousand five hundred six houses, three ri, thirty five cho. Yokote, two thousand seventy houses, four ri, twenty seven cho. Rokugo, one thousand sixty two houses, six ri. Shingoji, two hundred nine houses, one ri, twenty eight cho. Kubota, thirty six thousand five hundred eighty seven souls, sixteen ri. Minato, Two thousand one hundred eight houses, one ri, twenty eight cho. Abukawa, one hundred sixty three houses, three ri, thirty three cho. Ichinichi ichi, three hundred six houses, one ri, thirty four cho. Kado, one hundred fifty one houses, two ri, nine cho. Hinikoyama, three hundred ninety six houses two ri nine cho tsugurata one hundred eighty six houses one ri fourteen cho tubine one hundred fifty three houses one ri eighteen cho kirishi thirty one houses one ri fourteen cho kotsunagi forty seven houses one ri sixteen cho tsuguriko one hundred 
one hundred thirty six houses three ri five cho odatte one thousand six hundred seventy three houses four ri twenty three cho shirasawa seventy one houses two ri nineteen cho ikarigazeki one hundred seventy five houses four ri eighteen cho kuroishi one thousand one hundred seventy six houses six ri nineteen cho daishaka forty three houses four ri shinjo fifty one houses two ri twenty one cho aomori one ri twenty four cho total one hundred fifty three ri nine cho about three hundred sixty eight miles this is considerably under the actual distance as on several of the mountain routes the ri is fifty six cho but in the lack of accurate information the ri has been taken at its ordinary standard of thirty six cho throughout end of section thirty nine of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in September 2012. Letter 33. Hakodate, Yezo, August 13, 1878. After a tremendous bluster for two days, the weather has become beautifully fine, and I find the climate here more invigorating than that of the main island. It is Japan, but yet there is a difference somehow. When the mists lift, they reveal not mountains smothered in greenery, but naked peaks, volcanoes only recently burnt out, with the red ash flaming under the noonday sun, and passing through shades of pink into violet at sundown strips of sand border the bay ranges of hills with here and there a patch of pine or scrub fade into the far-off blue and the great cloud shadows lie upon their scored sides in indigo and purple blue as the adriatic are the waters of the landlocked bay and the snowy sails of pale junks look whiter than snow against its intense azure the abruptness of the double peaks behind the town is softened by a belt of cryptomeria the sandy strip which connects the headland with the mainland heightens the general resemblance of the contour of the ground to gibraltar but while one dreams of the western world a kuruma passes one at a trot temple drums are beaten in a manner which does not recall the roll of the british drums a buddhist funeral passes down the street or a man-cart pulled and pushed by four yellow-skinned little clothed mannequins creaks by with the monotonous grunt of ha huida a single look at hakodate itself makes one feel that it is japan all over the streets are very wide and clean but the houses are mean and low the city looks as if it had just recovered from a conflagration the houses are nothing but tinder the grand tile roofs of some other cities are not to be seen there is not an element of permanence in the wide and windy streets it is an increasing and busy place it lies for two miles along the shore and has climbed the hill till it can go no higher but still houses and people look poor it has a skeleton aspect too which is partially due to the number of permanent clothes horses on the roofs stones however are its prominent feature looking down upon it from above you see miles of great boulders and realize that every roof in the windy capital is hodden down by a weight of paving stones nor is this all some of the flatter roofs are pebbled all over like a courtyard and others such as the roof of this house for instance are covered with sod and crops of grass the two latter arrangements being precautions against risks from sparks during fires. These paving stones are certainly the cheapest possible mode of keeping the roofs on the houses in such a windy region, but they look odd. 
none of the streets except one high up the hill with a row of fine temples and temple grounds call for any notice nearly every house is a shop most of the shops supply only the ordinary articles consumed by a large and poor population either real or imitated foreign goods abound in main street and the only novelties are the furs skins and horns which abound in shops devoted to their sale i covered the great bear furs and the deep cream coloured furs of aino dogs which are cheap as well as handsome there are many second-hand or as they are called curio shops and the cheap lacquer from aomori is also tempting to a stranger i l b end of section forty forty one of unbeaten tracks in japan by isabella l bird this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avai in september two thousand and twelve letter thirty four hakodate yezo i am enjoying hakodate so much that though my tour is all planned and my arrangements are made i linger on from day to day there has been an unpleasant eclaircissement about ito you will remember that i engaged him without a character and that he told both lady parks and me that after i had done so his former master mr marys asked him to go back to him to which he had replied that he had a contract with a lady mr marys is here and i now find that he had a contract with ito by which ito bound himself to serve him as long as he required him for seven dollars a month but that hearing that i offered twelve dollars he ran away from him and entered my service with a lie mr marys had been put to the greatest inconvenience by his defection and has been hindered greatly in completing his botanical collection for ito is very clever and he had not only trained him to dry plants successfully but he could trust him to go away for two or three days and collect seeds i am very sorry about it he says that ito was a bad boy when he came to him but he thinks that he cured him of some of his faults and that he has served me faithfully i have seen mr marys at the consuls and have arranged that after my yezo tour is over ito shall be returned to his rightful master who will take him to china and formosa for a year and a half and who i think will look after his well-being in every way dr and mrs hepburn who are here heard a bad account of the boy after i began my travels and were uneasy about me but except for this original lie i have no fault to find with him and his shinto creed has not taught him any better when i paid him his wages this morning he asked me if i had any fault to find and i told him of my objection to his manners which he took in very good part and promised to amend them but he added mine are just missionary manners yesterday i dined at the consulate to meet count diesbach of the french legation mr von siebold of the austrian legation and lieutenant kreitner of the austrian army who start to-morrow on an exploring expedition in the interior intending to cross the sources of the rivers which fall into the sea on the southern coast and measure the heights of some of the mountains they are well found in food and claret but take such a number of pack-ponies with them that i predict that they will fail and that i who have reduced my luggage to forty-five pounds will succeed i hope to start on my long projected tour to-morrow i have planned it for myself with the confidence of an experienced traveller and look forward to it with great pleasure as a visit to the aborigines is sure to be full of novel and interesting experiences Goodbye for a long time. I. L. B. End of section forty one.